Suppose I have a particle P traveling along a three-dimensional path under the influence of certain forces, so that the net force in the x direction is Fx, the net force in the y direction is Fy, and the net force in the z direction is Fz. In this case, let's assume that all these forces are conservative, which means there are no dissipative influences like friction, air resistance, etc. Let's also assume that the position of the particle is a function of time that's dictated by three coordinates, x of t, y of t, and z of t. So we've got ourselves a single particle system in three dimensions. Now, what's the kinetic energy of this particle? Well, it's given by the sum of the kinetic energies in the x direction, in the y direction, and in the z direction. The dot superscript, by the way, denotes a derivative in time. So x dot would be the derivative of x with respect to time, which is just the velocity in the x direction. Now, in addition to the kinetic energy, the particle also has a potential energy given by u, which is a function of the particle's position. If you remember your first year physics courses, then you probably know that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is the total energy. After all, that's probably the biggest reason to include these two quantities in a physics problem. You want to find the total energy. But in this video, I won't be adding the kinetic and potential energy. I'll be subtracting them. Now you might wonder why I'm subtracting the kinetic and potential energies. After all, subtracting them doesn't give you anything physically meaningful like total energy. Or does it? I'm going to ask you to suspend your disbelief and believe me when I say that Ek minus U is indeed a meaningful physical quantity. In fact, it even has a name. It's called the Lagrangian of the system, which I'll denote by this fancy L. Now because the kinetic energy depends on the velocities of the particle, so x dot, y dot, and z dot, and because the potential energy depends on the position of the particle x, y, and z, we can say that the Lagrangian of the particle depends on all the positions and, all, and their time derivatives. Let's manipulate this Lagrangian quantity now. We'll start by taking the partial derivative with respect to x, which would just turn out to be the negative partial of u with respect to x, because only u depends on x. The kinetic energy just depends on the velocities. Now recall what I said earlier about the forces being conservative? Well, we can apply that assumption here. Because the forces are conservative, f is equal to the negative of the gradient of u, which in this case would mean that the negative partial of u with respect to x can be written as fx, or the force in the x direction. The next derivative we'll take is the partial of l with respect to x dot, which is the same as writing the partial of ek with respect to x dot, because ek is the only term in the Lagrangian that actually depends on x dot. We can go up to the expression for ek and see that the partial of ek with respect to x dot is just m times x dot, which is just the momentum in the x direction. Now what if we take the time derivative of this whole equation? Well, in that case we'll get the time derivative of partial l partial x dot equals the time derivative of the x momentum. But look at this quantity on the right hand side, the derivative of x momentum with respect to time. We already know that Newton's second law says that the net force in the x direction is equal to the rate of change of x momentum. And since the force fx equals the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x, and since the rate of change of momentum equals the time derivative of dl dx dot, we can say that the partial of L with respect to x equals the time derivative of the partial of L with respect to x dot using Newton's second law. And this equation is called a Lagrange equation. You can perform the exact same derivation for the y and z coordinates, and when you do that you'll find that there are a total of three Lagrange equations for the particle p in the three dimensions. Now the idea behind these three Lagrange equations is that you can solve them in order to determine the equation of motion of your particle. The reasoning behind that is that since the Lagrange equations are equivalent to Newton's second law as I just demonstrated, we can use the Lagrange equations just like we can use Newton's second law to determine the equations of motion of our particle.
So in other words, determining x of t, y of t, z of t. There's something else also that's implicated from these Lagrange equations in x, y, and z. If you look at these Lagrange equations, you'll see that they're pretty much the same as the Euler Lagrange equations we covered in my Calculus of Variation series. The only differences have to do with the different variables, but other than that, these Lagrange equations look exactly like the Euler Lagrange equations. And because they very strongly resemble the Euler-Lagrange equations, there must be some functional that's being made stationary by these three Lagrange equations. That functional being made stationary is called the action integral, given by s equals the integral from t1 to t2 of l dt. And speaking of the action integral, now that we've introduced the action quantity, we are now in a position to talk about the principle of stationary action, also known as Hamilton's principle. The principle of stationary action says that if I have a particle p traveling from one point to another in a given time interval from t1 to t2, the path the particle traverses is such that this action integral is stationary. In other words, the particle traverses a path such that the integral from t1 to t2 of the Lagrangian, the kinetic minus the potential energy, is stationary. Now, in order to make this action integral stationary, we need to solve the Lagrange equations, which will give us the equations of motion of the particle. For instance, if we have a particle in the Cartesian coordinate system with coordinates x, y, and z, the Lagrange equations that will allow us to make this action integral stationary are simply found by applying Euler-Lagrange to this action integral. And those Lagrange equations will look something like this. Now we don't necessarily need to be in Cartesian coordinates to apply the principle of stationary action. We could just as easily use cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates. And in general, we can use a generalized coordinate system given by q1, q2, and q3, and formulate the exact same Lagrange equations for that generalized coordinate system where q1, q2, and q3 can be any nice enough coordinates that you want. And this is one reason that the Lagrange equations are so useful when determining a particle's trajectory in time. It's because we can easily apply them to other coordinate systems. Now let's do an example where we not only apply the principle of stationary action, but also give some intuition behind it. Say we have a ball of mass m, and say we throw that ball up in the air with some initial velocity from a vertical level of y equals zero. Gravity is acting downwards and the direction of positive y is up. Let's also suppose that it takes capital T seconds for the ball to come back down. Now you probably already know from your classical mechanics courses that if I were to plot the trajectory y of the particle as a function of time, the path would follow a parabola in time. But let's actually show using the principle of stationary action that the particle follows a parabolic trajectory in time. And in order to use the principle of stationary action, we need to formulate the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic minus potential energy. So starting with the kinetic energy of the particle, we know that the kinetic energy is one half m times y dot squared. And we know that the potential energy is the gravitational potential energy, which is mgy. In that case, the action integral would be the integral from zero to capital T of one half m times y dot squared minus mgy. And from this action integral, we can now apply the principle of stationary action, which says that the path the particle takes must make this action integral stationary. And in order to find that path, we need to use the Lagrange equation, which looks something like this. Now we can see that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y is just negative mg, and the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y dot is m times y dot. In that case, the Lagrange equation just becomes negative mg equals m times y double dot, or the second derivative of y with respect to t. We can cancel the m's and integrate the second order differential equation once to get an expression for y dot. We can then integrate it again to get our equation for the particle's motion, y as a function of time. And we can then use the fact that y equals zero at both t equals zero and t equals capital T to find the integration constants c1 and c2, 
And when we do that, here's what we'll get for y. And you can see that this is just a parabola with its zero set at t equals zero and at t equals capital T. And this agrees with what you would expect from standard classical mechanics. So indeed, the principle of stationary action does give correct results in that, in this case, it confirms what we already know from our first year physics courses. Now, let's get into some intuition behind this stationary action principle. Let's say that my optimal path, my one half times gt times capital T minus t for this problem, is represented by this parabola, the one that I've already drawn up here. What if I drew a path that was taller, that peaked at a higher point, but obeyed the same boundary condition, so something like 0.6 times g times t times capital T minus t? Well, in that case, the potential energy is higher because the particle peaks at a higher point, and that makes this negative term in the action integral larger, and so it contributes to the action integral becoming smaller overall. However, the kinetic energy needed to get to that higher point is also necessarily higher, so the positive term in the action integral would also be larger, which would contribute to the action integral itself being larger. And when you do the calculation, which is something that I encourage you to do just to prove it to yourself, you'll find that the increase in kinetic energy overpowers the increase in potential energy, such that the action of this higher peaking path is actually larger than the action of the optimal path we just found. But what if I drew a path that was shorter, that peaked at a lower point but obeyed the same boundary condition, so something like 0.4 times gt times capital T minus t. Well, in that case, the kinetic energy is lower, which makes this positive term in the action integral lower, which contributes to the action being smaller. However, the potential energy to get to that lower point is also necessarily lower, so the negative term in the action integral would be lower as well. Now when you do the calculation, again, something that I encourage you to do, you'll find that the decrease in potential energy actually offsets the decrease in kinetic energy, such that the action of this lower peaking path is again larger than the action of our optimal path. So the actions of both of these nearby paths are larger than the action of the optimal path we computed using the principle of stationary action. And this would suggest to you that the optimal path actually makes the action a local minimum. So intuitively, you can see that the optimal path of the particle falling under gravity is a path that corresponds to a local minimum in the action integral because the surrounding paths all make the action integral larger. And you probably know that a local minimum, in fact, is a type of stationary point. So this optimal path makes the action integral stationary, by extension. Anyway, that does it for this video. In the next lesson, I'll talk about some ways we can extend the principle of stationary action to more complex systems that are now constrained, unlike the unconstrained systems we spoke about here. I'll finish off by thanking the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description so that you can check it out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.